The Tom Woods Show, episode 1839. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. We are continuing Scott Horton Week. By now, you know Scott Horton. He is editorial director of antiwar.com, director of the Libertarian Institute, host of Anti War Radio on 90.7 FM KPFK in Los Angeles, host of The Scott Horton Show. Check him out at scotthorton.org. And we're talking all this week about topics to be found in his book, Enough Already. Time to End the War on Terrorism, brand new book, but hot off the presses. Like it talks about some of Biden's personnel choices. Here we are only in February and Scott's book is able to include that. That's pretty darn good. So I I just have a few random things I want to talk to Scott about today and and, uh, start with his chapter on war all the time. So welcome back, Scott. Hey, Tom. Thanks for having me, man. All right. Kind of a potpourri episode here. I'm just going to throw some different things at you. And and a lot of them are covered in your book, but I'd just like to hear your thoughts about them. You have a chapter toward the end, war all the time. And it's, you know, the impression you get just from watching American foreign policy is that there's a, yeah, obviously there are institutional interests that keep the thing going and individual interests and so on and on. But there's also a tremendous inertia, I think also among the American public. And I don't know, this is how it's always been as far as I can remember. So I I guess we'll just keep on doing it. Mm-hmm. And you quote a bunch of politicians, famous ones like Obama, like George W. Bush, like Trump, campaigning on, hey, this is crazy. We're totally spread out too thin. We got to quit doing this. And then they get in and it's the same old thing. And, and this is the kind of thing that makes people think that there's a deep state, not just the spooks, but there's some kind of something that just keeps everything going, regardless mm-hmm. of who the president is. And I mean, that's what feeds into that kind of thinking. Right. How do you make sense? Of that? I mean, are they being insincere when they yeah. campaign and say, we got to get out of these? Or what do you think? Yeah. I mean, especially W. Bush was lying when he said he wanted a humble foreign policy and all this. He knew that that was a great line to use against Al Gore, that these Democrats have a nation building, using our military to help people when our military is for killing people with. Yeah, blah you know, peace through strength, meaning we're going to invade Iraq at my first opportunity, just wait. But he knew that what conservatives wanted to hear at the end of the 20th century, at the end of the Bill Clinton years, was we're coming home. Anybody who mistook this guy for Pat Buchanan's son rather than George Bush's son was making a big mistake. Barack Obama also was a cynical liar and murderer. And he knew he was nothing but Hillary Clinton, just like Joe Biden, essentially a right wing Democrat, you know, a liberal, as you know, they're mostly categorized now, maybe even a click to the right of the liberals. And I know that, oh, he's black and he went to a radical church and all of this stuff. And he in right wing media and in liberal media, it served both sides to pretend that he was some kind of progressive leftist, you know, radical, whatever, whether you like that kind of thing or whether that's what scares you the most. When really all he ever was was George W. Bush, the compassionate conservative, you know, and all George W. Bush was, was Bill Clinton and all Bill Clinton ever was, was Bush's father anyway. It's all the same thing, all of these guys. And so when Obama ran, he, like his predecessor, knew that what the American people want to hear is that their children's lives have value. You're not just going to send them to war for no reason. If we're going to fight, it's because we have to fight, right? Or else what are we doing? That's what everybody believes. And so they have to tell us, no, no, we don't want to be the policemen of the world. That's not the American tradition. And boy, I'll tell you what, I'm going to end the mindset that gets us into these conflicts, Barack Obama said. But that just wasn't true, right? Like he did draw down, I mean, what Bush did in, Iraq War II and marching the whole army and Marine Corps in there the way he did is just something else. I mean, there's, what can you say? But then everything Obama did after that, whether it was the drone wars in Pakistan and Yemen, or whether it was a couple years later when he turned around and took the side of the terrorists against the various dictators around the region. You know, the guy was always an interventionist. His idea always was how, unlike the guys that came before him, he knew how to fix it. He knew what to do. He was going to make it right. And at the very least, he wasn't going to let John McCain call him a wimp. 
He wasn't going to sit there and be attacked from the right as being a weak liberal Democrat the whole time. And we know, for example, when he launched the surge in Afghanistan, he only wanted to send a couple battalions. He campaigned on, I'm going to send a couple battalions to Afghanistan. Once he got in there, they said, yeah, you're going to give us 70,000 more troops is what you're going to do. And he was terrified of them. And so in order to look tough, he rolled over and did whatever Petraeus, his subordinate, ordered him to do. And then there's the same thing with Donald John Trump. Well, I can't look weak, so I better act weak and give in to these guys who want to go do tough guy stuff, and that'll make me look tough. I'm going to go bomb the hell out of ISIS. And you can go back. I bet I can find it on, on Twitter. I quit Twitter for like three or four years, but now I'm back like some kind of horrible drug addict. Yeah, I didn't know if that was you or somebody acting as you yeah. for nah, you. Yeah, it's okay. me because I got to sell I'm the glad. book, so I got to do something, you know? Okay. But I bet you could find the tweet from 2015 where I say, Donald Trump on his first day in office, what are my orders, general? Sir, yes, sir, sir. Because he doesn't know anything. And he's not a Jeffersonian. He's a Jacksonian if he has an ideology at all. It's just, look at me. I'm a right-wing patriot tough guy. You can't handle the truth. I got to stand on the wall. Blah, blah, blah. No nothing tough guy-ism, which he knew also that what the American people wanted to hear was, yeah, we shouldn't have done that. And he knew he had to defeat Jeb Bush by tying him to his brother and his brother's failures and all of that. But at the same time, he campaigned on, oh, we're going to torture him. And as he said, even if it doesn't get good information, I don't care. They deserve it anyway. And we're going to kill their family members too. And when James Mattis, as soon as he was sworn in, he called in the Secretary of Defense, Mad Dog Mattis. And he said, listen, I want you to devolve battlefield authority for who can order strikes on what? All the way down the chain of command, as low as you can go. If a sergeant wants to call in an airstrike on a city, let him do it. I don't care. Is within the law, any... Any new bureaucratic rules and checkboxes that the Obama government made up, all of them are canceled and then some. And then Mattis said, that's right, what we're going to do, we're going to wage a war of annihilation against ISIS. And Trump said, yeah, that sounds good to me, war of annihilation. And so you know, I fought with old Justin. He wouldn't mind me trashing him. I fought with old Justin about this uh, back then, unfortunately, publicly on Twitter, Justin Romando about this, where, you know, Trump, I'm for and against everything. Justin, wow, I like some of the things this guy says. You know, when yeah. he was just shining you on, man. Just like, you know, we used to make fun of the Obama bots and say, oh yeah, no, there's the secret Obama. Once we win the midterms, then the secret Obama is going to come out and give justice to the Palestinians and then the one war in Afghanistan and do all of these things. There's no secret Obama. What you see is what you get. And the same thing with Trump is, and, and honestly, the reason that the power elite, the deep state, as you correctly call it, hated Trump is because he doesn't believe in the sacred American world empire and our, you know, God-given destiny to lead mankind into the brave new future and all this crap. Because Donald Trump doesn't even understand what that stuff means anyway, much less, you know, go up there and participate in the ceremony and really believe in it. Right. And so that's what they hated about him is he would go, well, what the hell are we doing in Japan and Korea anyway? Aren't those rich nations that can defend themselves? I don't, I don't know. And they were like, you know, their brains exploded. This guy's going to ruin everything, which wasn't ever true. Right. They could have just as easily said, oh, I get it. You know, he's just as concerned with being a fake macho right wing tough guy as he is with you know, wasting money, helping our no good Nick allies. So we'll just focus on the tough guy part and then it'll be fine. And which it was, he did four years. He didn't end a single war. I mean, he did sign a, a peace deal with the Taliban, but then again, the peace deal says it's not in effect till May of this year when he's not in power anymore. And Biden's in the perfect position to cancel it, which he's already going to do. And so all Trump did is escalate people. Donald Trump didn't start any new wars. Really? Well, he like quadrupled the air war in Afghanistan and killed probably 30,000 innocent people. Absolutely. He sent the infantry to help escalate the war against the people of Somalia. And I don't know if it can really be fairly said that he escalated, but he absolutely certainly continued Barack Obama and Mohammed bin Salman's war against Yemen. That was a real no fooling genocide. 
the whole time. And when people asked him, why are we doing this? He would say, for the money. Don't you know the Saudis are spending $450 billion on our weapons? And that's creating millions of jobs. Like this guy is either the worst liar in the world or the dumbest SOB ever to be the president of the United States. $450 billion, huh? Yeah, in the next century, Saudi spends about $3 billion a year, which is the budget of the smallest town in your state, right? I mean, what are we talking about? They provide William Hartung crunch the numbers. Saudi dollars flowing in to buy American weapons help sustain somewhere on the order of 20 to 30,000 jobs. In other words, it's not even a calculable remainder on our economy in any way whatsoever. But Donald Trump trots out these completely inflated, ridiculous numbers, and then just says, essentially, the Americans are mercenaries and we kill for money. The Saudis are paying us to kill these people. And so we're killing them. We're cashing checks. And he had no other excuse. He wasn't even smart enough to remember the lie he was supposed to tell that Iran is taking over Yemen. That's why we have to do it. Somebody get the president his talking point. He just said the purpose of the American people is to kill other governments, enemies in third countries for dollars. Oh. And then check out Biden. <laughs> Biden didn't even say he wants to end in war. I mean, he did say he would get out of Yemen. But then he didn't even pretend like W. Bush and Obama and Trump that he was anti-war. He didn't even pretend that, yes, this stuff has got to stop. He said, no, I'm definitely leaving a strong contingent of forces in the Middle East to fight terrorism, of course. A deal with the Taliban where we leave Afghanistan? That sounds unreasonable. That was the platform the Democrats just won on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. And, and, and then to watch people, every time you know, Trump would have a decent instinct, it would be, well, he's claiming he's going to leave, but he's not doing it like with Syria. He's not doing it responsibly. Uh, right. Uh, res responsibly is their biggest weasel word. Yeah, I should give him credit because he really did want to leave Syria twice in 18 and 19, and they just stopped him. Just, they countermanded his orders. I mean, Mattis resigned over it in, I guess it was in 18 that Mattis resigned over it. And then he backed down anyway, changed his mind anyway and stayed anyway. Yeah. And then James Jeffrey, who worked for him later, just bragged on the way out the door in an interview with Defense News that, oh yeah, we just lied to him all the time. I just told him there were only 200 guys in Syria when there were always many more than that. All depends on how you count them, wink, wink. You know, this guy's not the elected president at all, apparently. He's just some idiot in a chair and the bureaucrats who work for him get to lie to him about what they're doing and countermand his orders and just do whatever they want. In fact, back to that deep state thing for a second. Remember when they impeached Trump the first time under this Ukraine gate hoax, son of Russia gate nonsense. And in the testimony of the rat, well, this, not Cheramella, but the other rat, uh, Vindman, who like passed on Cheramella's accusations or whatever it was, in his testimony, He's just absolutely flummoxed. He's like, look, I mean, the inner agency has already decided what our Russia policy is. We have a Russia policy and it's we have to contain Russian aggression. We have to defend Europe from Russian aggression. We have to integrate Ukraine into our system as fast as we can. All of these things. And now the president of the United States is trying to change it. Like, what right does he have to change our Russia policy? Yeah. And nobody screamed at him that, man, you're a lieutenant colonel. What right do you have to dictate America's Russia policy to the president of the United States? Are you crazy? What the hell is the interagency? Is that like the Holy Ghost or something? Well, not it, to mention, It's not Scott, a department with an office anywhere. But also you would get things like, if I were going to withdraw from such and such place, I would consult the generals and whatever, and he should consult the general. You don't consult the generals about a political question. A political question is, should we be here or not? A military question would be, what's the best strategy if we want to cut off this population from that one? I ask the generals that. Right. I don't ask them, should we be there or not? That's a philosophical question. Right. So the idea that he should consult the generals is just a category mistake anyway. Right. And then you look at how fundamentally dishonest all these people are, Tom. And it's just sickening, man, where, you know, oh, yeah, no, we got to fight ISIS. We got to stay in Syria because of ISIS. ISIS, ISIS, ISIS. But ISIS is dead and gone. And occasionally they slip and go, well, you know, really, come on. Why would we back ISIS in the first place? It's because we hate Iran. And how did Assad win the war? He asked Iran for help. Iran sent their IRGC and Hezbollah came from Lebanon. 
and then eventually the Russians as well to help save the state. And so, oops, <laughs> we launched this war to bring Iran down a peg after we gave them Baghdad. Now we're going to take away Damascus from them. But instead, we made Damascus more dependent on Tehran than ever before. So now we extra double plus super can't leave. Now we have to stay at the Al Tamf Air Base on the Iraqi Syrian border because that's the land bridge, Tom. You know, a road. That's where the road from Iran through Iraq into Syria and all the way to Beirut runs. Now, there used to be a big, ugly Saddam Hussein in the way as a roadblock on that land bridge, but now there's not. And now ISIS is destroyed too, and at least that road is secured by Iraqi Shiite forces, and so the Iranians can ship weapons to Hezbollah straight through. The David Wormser Richard Pearl plan exactly backfired. And, you know, Syria and now Iraq share this role as the keystone in the arc of Shiite power there. And so that's why the Americans have to stay, not because of ISIS, not because of anti-American terrorists, but because Iran helps Hezbollah defend themselves from Israel, essentially, by helping them build up a missile deterrent force. And so, which potentially could be an offensive force, I guess, but it's not like they have the infantry to invade Israel. Don't be silly. Those missiles are there to keep Israel out. Which, by the way, the Israelis have been bombing Syria this whole time. Whenever they think they've found where Iran and Syria are shipping missiles to Hezbollah, they bomb them for years and years and years with no response whatsoever from the Syrians or Hezbollah or Iran. They just have absolute impunity to, you know, I guess some stuff slips through, but they admit that's why we have to stay. Has nothing to do with fighting for freedom, has nothing to do with spreading democracy, has nothing to do with securing American interests has everything to do with the Israelis and what their fifth column in Washington, D.C. wants, which is, again, diametrically opposite of the interests of the American people. The American people's enemies here in this case are, and yes, our government created them for us in the first place. I ain't saying that, but they are the radical bin Ladenite factions from our allied Sunni states who seek to overthrow their countries but need to get us out of the way first. So they, you know, provoke us, bog us down, bleed us to bankruptcy, and get rid of us the hard way. Those are the enemies of the American people, Al-Qaeda, and not Al-Shabaab defining it broadly to Somalia, but like Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula helped coordinate September 11th, tried to blow up a plane over Detroit on Christmas Day 2009, and these are real dangerous terrorists. But our government doesn't care about them. Our government will ally with them and use them, as we've seen in Libya, Syria, and in Yemen as long as they're fighting the Shiites. And why? Because Israel and Saudi, and I guess the American government too, hate Iran more. They hate the Shiites more, even though those hijackers were not Hezbollah. They were bin Laden's men, the opposite on the other side. So that's, the, that's really the game of the whole book. It's not even, in fact, Lori Calhoun, the great Lori Calhoun says, I think you should change the title. It should be you know, you're like giving them too much credit by calling it the war on terrorism when, as you describe in the book, it's really not a war on terrorism at all, is it? It's a war on whatever they feel like in the name of the war on terrorism. And in many cases, wars, in three major cases, wars fought directly, deliberately for al-Qaeda. I mean, what Bush did for al-Qaeda in Iraq War II was magnificent from their point of view, but it was a big, stupid accident. But what Obama did for him in Libya, Syria, and Yemen, and what Trump continued on in Yemen, man, that goes to show you and me, our audiences, the American people, we cannot trust this government to take care of this problem for us. Wanted dead or alive, 400 men. That was 20 years ago. Hey, folks, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor whose product either you or someone you know and care about could certainly use, and that's Lucy Nicotine. It's a company founded by Caltech scientists and former smokers looking for a better and cleaner nicotine alternative. Finally, tobacco alternatives that don't suck. They have a nicotine gum with four milligrams of nicotine that comes in three flavors, wintergreen, cinnamon, and pomegranate. They also have a lozenge with four milligrams of nicotine in cherry ice flavor. And each and every flavor actually tastes great. And it's convenient and discreet. You can be enjoying Lucy's products anywhere, on flights, at work, even in the gym. And let's face it, we all know people who would be quite happy to switch to a cleaner alternative to cigarettes if they knew it was an option. 
I certainly do. And that person, dear listener, could be yourself. Well, look, it's 2021. Get rid of your cigarettes, unplug your vape, throw out your dip, get some Lucy nicotine gum or lozenges. This is the real deal. A subscription to Lucy comes directly to your door each month. It's so simple. And you don't have to leave your house because Lucy has delivery down. And Tom Woods listeners, go to lucy.co and use promo code WOODS to get 20% off all products on your first order, including gum or lozenges. That's lucy.co and use promo code WOODS at checkout. Also, I have to give this disclaimer. Warning. This product contains nicotine derived from tobacco. Nicotine is an addictive chemical. Lucy.co, and be sure to use that promo code WOODS. I want to shift gears because before we finish, I want to ask you something completely unrelated. But as I say, I had random topics in my mind for today. We talked a little bit about Africa in the last episode, but you have a line in your book that I'd like you to elaborate on. You say, great power competition with China lies at the heart of American strategy in Africa. First of all, here's two things that would be of interest to most Americans. Number one, I don't think most Americans know there is an American strategy in Africa, much less that it's in the service of some kind of strategic uh, opposition to China. So can you explain what this amounts to? Yeah. I mean, in fact, I think our whole Middle East policy in a way has to do with containing China. You know, as Dick Cheney put it way back in 1991, and, uh, you know, Michael Clare who's a progressive, but a, a really smart guy. He understands our economics from our point of view, not only from a left point of view. He's a really smart guy. Has talked about, you know, the importance, not of the corruption of the Houston oil companies and all that. Obviously, that's a little bit of it. But what it really mostly is, is it's the control of these strategic choke points in the event of a war, especially with China because they have very little oil resources. The Russians got their own hydrocarbons. They're not worried about it. But in the event of a war with China, or for that matter, to help us coerce our friends, the Australians, the Koreans, the Japanese, the Indians, whoever you got, we got to control those choke points. It's a matter of military and political dominance of the planet. And yes, Exxon gets their kickbacks, but you know that's not leftists would be leftists who think it's just, oh, the corporations are the heart of it are missing the point. It's a military strategy and dominating the entire Middle East. If it had worked out the way Dick Cheney had imagined or whatever, that then would have given us that much more leverage over the Chinese. And for that matter, again, our friends, the Japanese and the rest too. Now, in the case of Africa, there's really not that much oil resources there. There's some in what's now an independent nation, South Sudan, that the CIA broke off in the Obama years, in the Bush and Obama years. It took them a while to do it. But they separated South Sudan away from the rest of Sudan. And there's some oil resources there that I think they're trying to prevent the Chinese from, from getting. But, you know, Africa, whatever resources they do have are certainly marginal when it comes to, you know, like, let's say America and China just absolutely disregarded the rights of the people of that continent entirely and just went on, you know, a big great game contest to soak up all those resources. It would almost certainly be, you know, a waste. It would almost certainly be uneconomic to do because, you know, whatever resource they do, they don't have that much oil or there's not that much discovered oil. And certainly, you know, it's a huge continent. So if you find oil in the center of the country, that means you need a pipeline, of, you know, 2,000 miles long to get it to the coast and cross four countries and numerous different levels of security situations and all these things. It's just... I mean, what are we going to do? Steal their timber? You know what I mean? There's just, there's really not that much to take from these people. There's, you know, obviously there are, you know, minerals in the Congo and in precious gems in South Africa and stuff like that. But this is essentially marginal, certainly in the sense of like, could it possibly justify the American effort to keep the Chinese, the American military effort to keep the Chinese from showing up with briefcases? and bribing whoever they need to bribe to do the business that they need to do. You know, does it really cost the Americans anything if China becomes a major economic force on the continent of Africa? I mean, if you're not a right-wing nationalist, then I think the answer is, who cares? You know, if, if the Chinese are going over there with money and they're doing business with Africans of whatever nation, well, I don't know, in the Cliff's Notes of... Mises that I read, that means that everybody's benefiting and more wealth is being created for all the world to share. What do I care? I only care if I think that the U.S. government 
you know, has a right to deny the creation of wealth to other people. And I'm truly not afraid of the rise of China in the way that it's portrayed. I mean, all this economic growth is because the Americans convinced them to abandon communism in favor of fascism. So not that fascism is okay, but it's been a hell of a lot more productive than Maoist communism ever was when people were starving to death by the tens of millions. And now you have this extremely rapid economic growth, the greatest. I mean, think about that, right? I remember Lou Rockwell years ago wrote an article called From Death Camp to Civilization about you shut your mouth about China, man. You don't know. These Maoists raised that society to the ground. They made George Bush look like a hero what they did to China, the communists. And for them to come from essentially caveman status artificially imposed on them by the communists to the level of wealth that they have circa 2007 or eight when Lou wrote this thing, it's an absolute miracle that nobody could have ever magic wished for. And the fact that people are, Americans are threatened by that, trying to make an enemy out of that, when that was what we had done for them. We sent Milton Friedman over there to tell Deng Xiaoping that you're doing it wrong. And we saved a civilization. We, some Americans saved a civilization by teaching some aspects of market economics to this totalitarian one-party state that, again, was starving people to death by the tens of millions leading up to this. But it's still China. And the Chinese decided like 3,000 years ago, or I don't know Chinese history, when the hell was the Qin Dynasty? It was a long time ago where they consolidated their empire and they haven't gone on foreign adventures since. They have had no, everyone else to the Chinese are foreign devils. They're like the most chauvinist people in the world. And they have no need to, you know, dirty themselves by going and trying to conquer other people's countries. And look, I'm not the expert on China, but I've heard this and learned this over and over again that, you know, in fact, one expert on my show told me about how like a thousand years ago, the Chinese built this giant fleet, the most magnificent fleet in world history up until that time. And they sent it all throughout the Indies and Africa and Southern, you know, Asia. And then they came back and said, it's terrible out there. Everybody's horrible. Their food's terrible. The weather's terrible. And we're all coming home and we're staying home. And leave us alone and we'll leave you alone. And that's been part of their culture this whole time. And then look at the example of what the Americans are doing to themselves, to us, to our society, right in front of their eyes. You think President Xi is looking at the U.S. and saying, yeah, as soon as the Americans are out of the way, I'm going full George W. Bush. And I'm going to invade everywhere and kill everybody and dominate everything and create a Chinese world empire because that's the ticket to riches. After we're done, our empire's done crumbling and out of the way. That's the lesson that the Chinese are going to learn from us. You know, when I think, no, it's more likely they'll actually learn the lesson from the Soviet empire that we should have learned, especially since we helped inflict it on them, that overextension will destroy your empire. And that you're actually better off just doing business. You know, the era of invading a country and stealing all their women and gold and all of this for profit, like, I mean, that just doesn't make any economic sense anymore, even if you are a monster. Like, if you are a monster, you should become a CEO and be a productive man because there's just no use in being a militarist. You can't, there's no profit in invading a country. The only profit, as uh, Garrett Garrett put it in Rise of Empire. In the American empire, everything goes out and nothing comes back. The real corruption in it is selling the weapons to the American taxpayer to use in the war. It doesn't come from, as Donald Trump put it, stealing the oil. Let's take the oil. What are you going to do? Scoop it up with a giant spoon or something? Occupy the place forever and just outright steal it from the people who live there and give them no money like the British empire or something like that? Why don't we just do business with them? And think about the counterfactual. You know, I love this part of it, Tom. Maybe I'm ruining the end of the book here or whatever. I don't know. But never mind stupid, horrible Al Gore. He's horrible. And and who knows what he would have done, but it would have been bad. Okay? This is no argument for him. But just imagine that George W. Bush in the year 2000 and 2001 there in the transition, that instead of hiring Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz and Richard Pearl and the neoconservatives. 
what if he had just hired a couple of generic senators from Indiana or wherever to be his vice president and secretary of defense? And what if Colin Powell, his secretary of state, had been his primary counselor on foreign policy? That's what the American people were voting for. I know it. I remember, man. And I was driving a cab at that time, and I heard people say over and over and over and over again that, yes, it's true that George W. Bush is George Bush's idiot son, but he's got really good people with him like Colin Powell, and they're real adults. They know what to do. I don't know about Cheney. He's kind of mean, but that Colin Powell, he's just great. We trust him. We know he's going to guide this ship right. That's what people really believed. And of course, that wasn't true. In fact, the one thing that Colin Powell did, he blew his entire wad preventing a conflict with China over the, the down spy plane in the spring of 01. He went, whoa, 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 we are not going to fight. We're going to apologize. We're going to ask very nicely for our plane and crew back. And we're going to let this thing die. And the Hawks were pissed. And that was it. That was the last time that he won a real fight in the government. From then, it was Cheney and Rumsfeld and the neoconservative hawks took over everything. And don't get me wrong, the man belongs in prison. He was lying and he knew he was lying when he gave his speech to the United Nations justifying the war, for that matter, to the American people before the United Nations justifying the war. And he absolutely clicked his heels and obeyed George Bush's commands to help him start this massive aggressive war against the law. So I'm not arguing for the man. But I am saying it's just almost indisputable, I think, that if he had been the one up there without Cheney and Rumsfeld and the neocons, then essentially none of this would have happened. They probably would have been able to stop September 11th in the first place without the neocons going, no, 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 Iraq, 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 Iraq. Don't listen to the CIA. Iraq, 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 Iraq. Forget Osama bin Laden. What's he going to do? Nothing. Leave him alone. Forget that. Iraq, Iraq. It wouldn't have been like that. They might have been able to stop the attack in the first place just to have a competent person up there you know, instead of having to fight these crazy turf wars about all these other things. But even then, if that if September 11th had happened, I'm sure they would have invaded Afghanistan. We'd probably still be in Afghanistan today. But they would have never gone and bumped off Saddam Hussein. They would have never invaded Iraq and stayed for eight years and fought a giant sectarian cleansing campaign on behalf of Iran and force the Sunnis into the arms of Al-Qaeda. And then on from there, all the consequences from Iraq War II and of course, Bush was the one who started the war in Somalia, not Obama. But then Obama, of course, went and spread the war all over the place, North Africa and the Levant and down into the Arabian Peninsula and the rest of it. And none of this had to happen at all. None of it. You know, and I, I admit, yeah, it probably would have gone to Afghanistan. That would have been horrible. I wrote a whole book about how horrible it is. But man, compared to knocking over the whole Middle East the way that they did, and that's your counterfactual. If it had just, if it had just been... I mean, well, hell, you, you wouldn't even necessarily have to be rid of Cheney and Rumsfeld, right? You would just have to have Bush, W. Bush, feel about Cheney the way that in the, our timeline, in the real world, he felt about Powell, which is, yeah, 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 I heard what you had to say, but I don't really care so much. I'm listening to him, right? So even if Cheney and Rumsfeld had been there, but just if W. Bush had said, you know what, Colin, I can tell that you're a lot smarter than these guys and have less of a vested interest and getting away with bloody murder here. So let me listen to what you have to say a little more carefully. But he didn't have any interest in doing that. And here we are. But that's, in other words, that's the hair difference between the way that the 21st century has played out and the way it could have instead. It's the flip of a nickel, you know? Yeah. Before we wrap up, I, I want to share a, one of my favorite quotations because you were talking about, well, who cares if China you know, has economic power or in Africa, and power is even the wrong word because that, that just mistakes what economics is. Because what what is the point of, I mean, unless what's driving us is just, we all have to have one of those foam gloves with the number one on it you know, for <laughs> yeah. the USA. Like, you know, unless that's what drives our policy, just this kind of primitive jingoism or, you know, kind of, uh, not even jingoism because it doesn't necessarily involve war, but just this idea that America has to be number one and it's naive to think we shouldn't be involved in Africa or whatever. Look, no, no, again, look, if you're a conservative, you, it doesn't, Africa is a wonderful place. Asia is a wonderful place, but you have a family and you have a town. And I 
guarantee you that will be plenty to keep you busy, okay? Right. The idea that your government, not you, <laughs> absolutely not you, your government's interests must be preserved. Over there. First of all, I don't even talk in terms of U.S. interests. It's always, it's always uh, cover for something. Mm-hmm. But, but the, the quotation I like is this, and that conservatives could stand to hear. This is Charles Pinckney, who signed the Constitution. He became governor of South Carolina. And he said this, we mistake the object of our government if we hope or wish that it is to make us respectable abroad. Conquest or superiority among other powers is not or ought never to be the object of Republican systems. If they are sufficiently active and energetic to rescue us from contempt and preserve our domestic happiness and security, it is all we can expect from them. It is more than almost any other government ensures to its citizens. See how modest that is? It isn't, we're number one, we're number one. He, that, that idea is totally foreign to him. But unfortunately, and I, obviously the, you know, the left liberals like Hillary are equally hopeless, but the so-called conservative movement, Conservatism Inc., has just failed people because no one even knows that quotation. No one even knows that point of view. They know Sean Hannity's latest book, and that's it. They don't know who Mises is. They don't know any of these things. Right. I don't blame them. What are they supposed to do? Well, you know what, too? There's a quote in the book I have of Thomas Friedman, you know, the center right, uh, center left liberal writer for the New York Times, very influential guy. And he has this famous quote about how McDonald's, which is supposedly the epitome of American successful capitalism and our highest ideals or whatever. I don't know how it got that label, but anyway, McDonald's and, you know, therefore standing in for all of American capitalism and and world capitalism cannot exist and survive without McDonald Douglas and without the mailed fist of the state to keep those sea lanes clear, to keep it fair, to enforce the world order so that we can have free trade so that we can have global capitalism. And so I thought, well, that sounds crazy to me, but I don't know, what do I know? So I went back and forth with your buddy, Bob Murphy. And I said, hey, Bob Murphy, I mean, I know you don't agree with this, but can you tell me, does anybody agree with this? I don't think I've ever heard of a capitalist economist who said that, yes, I mean, obviously we do have to have a world empire in order to have a capitalist country or in order to have free trade. Everybody knows that. I never heard anybody say that. And so I asked Bob Murphy, is that what capitalist economists say? That's what Tom Friedman says. Did Milton Friedman ever say that? Certainly Murray Rothbard and Ludwig von Mises never said that. But yeah, let's cast I... our net a little broader. Like, And Bob Murphy confirmed to me that he knows, I think I wrote this in the book. I forgot how I phrased this in the book. But the way he wrote it was that he knows of no capitalist in other words, classical school or Chicago or Austrian or any, as broadly as you can call it. He knows of no capitalist economist in the post-World War II era who has recommended world empire in order to guarantee the success of capitalism. Zero, and, and none, it's okay. so, so not only is that interesting in and of itself, but it goes to show that the Marxist critique is totally off. Right. Isn't there a view that, well, that's what you people need? Well, if that really is what our system needs, how come none of the advocates of that system are calling for it? Right. That's right. And, and look, I mean, I am an evangelical libertarian, but I don't really like focusing on all those arguments. I think a lot of those arguments are too smart for me. I'm not much of an economist and I'm not really like smart enough to talk about like really philosophical stuff and whatever. And as far as like spreading and promoting libertarianism, I think the best thing that I can do is just demonstrate that the most laissez-faire at all happen to be the best on war and peace. And that maybe that's not a coincidence. Well, listen, um, I want to take the last episode tomorrow and really bring us up to date with an issue that just won't leave the headlines. And that's Iran and its nuclear program. Let's spend a little time on that if we can. Because I I remember we had the war on, on Iraq. And then I remember in the second Bush term thinking in 2007 that they were going to have a war with Iran. And I remember specifically, I was in a a hotel room in Poland and I was watching like the only English language news channel I could find on the TV as I was going to sleep. And that was when we got the word that there had been some intelligence report concluding that, no, there really isn't a an Iranian nuclear program after all, as everybody's been telling you, it really isn't there. And it was really meant to stop George W. Bush in his tracks. And I remember thinking, oh, thank God. 
and then just going off to sleep. So, but yet we just heard they're weeks away. Once again, they've been weeks away for the yeah. last 25 years. So let's talk about that next time. But for now, tomwoods.com slash 1839 has Scott's book, Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. You got to go get this book. I'm featuring Scott all, all week long, not only because he's great, but to emphasize the importance of what he's done so you'll go and buy the book. So go do that. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you, Tom. Okay, folks, on a happier note, happier than war, of course, I want to tell you about a company created by a couple of Tom Wood Show listeners. They are John and Carrie Lakari. They're a husband and wife team. They're longtime listeners and supporters. And they started an online toy store in the midst of the pandemic in fall of 2020. They were inspired by their 16-month-old daughter. And the company is Nido Bambino. And it's N-I-D-O-B-A-M-B-I-N-O.com. And it specializes in selling engaging Montessori-inspired wooden toys for babies and toddlers. So I thought it'd be right up the alley of some of you folks. They noticed that the types of toys they wanted for their daughter were difficult to find or were available only through expensive subscription boxes. And so their goal is to make educational toys accessible and affordable without the commitment of a monthly subscription. So Nito Bambino has curated a collection of toys for every stage of development to help your child learn and flourish through play. And guess what? Of course, you get a discount when you use a special coupon code. Take 10% off your entire order when you use coupon code WOODS10 at nidobambino.com. That's N-I-D-O-B-A-M-B-I-N-O.com, nidobambino.com. Use promo code WOODS10 and take 10% off your entire order. I'll put a link to that site also on our show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1839. And again, a friendly reminder, you can get nice publicity like this on the Tom Woods Show for your website. But before you start the site, you got to check out tomwoods.com slash publicity to find out how to get all the goodies I give you, including the free publicity. So check that out. And Scott Horton Week continues and ends tomorrow. See you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.